Following our series for a rare and exclusive interview is special guest Julius Coleman AM, acclaimed lawyer, property pioneer and philanthropist who throughout a storied career over the course of more than four decades has been involved in a number of market shaping deals and transactions across a range of industries. Julius, pleasure having you as, as part of our series. I thought we'd start with your background. It's, a, it's an extraordinary story in and of itself. Take me through, if you could, your family's history in Poland and perhaps your journey to Australia in 1951. My parents met in Poland. Uh, Dad was take, being taken as a prisoner on a train back to Poland, jumped off the... Uh, back to Germany. Not back to, but to Germany. Um, he jumped off the train, you know, you know as the train slows going up a hill, they all jump off. Well, on the top of it, there are Nazis with submachine guns killing everyone. And Dad jumped and uh, got up uh, after the train had passed. Everyone else was dead and he hadn't been touched. He walked miles, found a farmhouse where the Polish underground was working. Um, he didn't know they just found the farmhouse. My mum was there. They met and uh, I was born <laughs> and uh, soon after, which was nice. And then the war ended and the Russians came in. So they were starting to do exactly the same as the Germans were. So Dad determined that he had to go out. He ended up in a refugee camp in Paris. The only form of currency in the camp was f food boxes from the Red Cross. Uh, so he would give up a month or two's supply to get someone's place in a list to go somewhere. He gave up two months supply to get on the list to Uruguay got to the front of the list and it was a false ticket. Did the same thing to, to Paraguay, same thing. Did the same thing to Australia and gets to the top of the list and they says, you're going there. So he had to give up two weeks supply to the only guy in the camp that had an atlas to find out where Australia was, what language they spoke um, and found it was completely the opposite side of the world, didn't know the language and every single thing that he ever acquired in his life in terms of learning and understanding in nearly 40 years had become completely worthless. <clears throat> so with a wife and two kids, uh, we came here as refugees. We were desperately poor, made even more desperately poor because the Australian government was helping you buy houses so you could buy a house on almost no deposit, but take this massive mortgage over 40 years. And so both parents had to work two jobs uh, just to basically pay uh, the mortgage, which they did. I get thrown straight into a school. I don't know anything about the language. I don't know anything about the people. And uh, I actually don't remember that affecting me at all. I don't remember language difficulties. I mean, we were all wogs. Everyone was called a wog, but everyone at my school, which is just the local state school, Elwood High School, everyone there was, almost everyone was a wog. Um, and so that didn't hurt all that much. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you would have been, what, four or five years old yeah. when you arrived to Australia. Talk, talk to me about Julius Coleman as a primary or secondary school kid. The first thing is that we were desperately poor. Um, I remember mum uh, every morning would cut up an, an apple or a piece of fruit into four quarters and we'd each get a quarter. That was our fruit ration for the day. And, and the folks were working really hard. Uh, Dad was on the production line at GMH. Mum was in a little um, sweatshop factory um, sewing women's knitting and sorry, with a sewing machine, men's and women's clothes. And then when they got some extra money, they bought an extra sewing machine, put it in, the, in, in a back room. And then two, and mum and dad would sew women's and men's clothes in the evening. Um, so, um, but we had a good life. We seemed to have a good life. So we're talking Australia in the 1950s, 1960s. 1950s yeah. what, what was that like? You couldn't get bread. Well, you, we say you couldn't get any bread because the only bread you could buy was the sliced white loaf, which is not bread, it's garbage. And, uh, but there were some uh, local Jewish bakers in St Kilda that started making real bread. And uh, I didn't find any difficulty in life then. Um, schools was, school was interesting, footy was great, got involved in all that sort of stuff. We were very poor, but it was a good life. We had family life. Every minute the parents had, they would take us out to local parks. Uh, we never went to a restaurant. Didn't know what a restaurant was, uh, but mum learned how to cook well, and <laughs> that, that was the life then. It wasn't just, I wasn't one out. That was probably the way of life for everyone I knew at the school. I had a lot of mates there who uh, 
that, you know, one of my mates there, who, who is desperately poor, he's the, uh, the heart surgeon at uh, Cabrini. Um, another one of my close mates is a, became a federal court judge. Um, so we all came up from that same sort of background, which is probably says, points at what's one of the greatest things about Australia is that it doesn't matter who you are and what your background is, uh, nothing stops you from succeeding. Uh, it's, it's a brilliant country. So as I understand it, you graduated from Elwood High School in 1961 and enrolled in a Bachelor of Law degree at the University of Melbourne. Talk me through this period of your life. Why, why the law? Well, the, I always wanted to be a lawyer. I don't know why. I think because I come from a, um, a European family and there's only two possible careers. As you're either going to do law or medicine and I didn't like anything to do with blood, so it became law. And it was never, it was never a negotiating point in my family. It just... It was all that was ever going to happen. I was very young for my, gra for my class. I was always a year younger than the youngest person. I don't know how that happened. But somehow I got into... Well, when I say somehow, I got into law by the most bizarre circumstance. Um, my parents being European, when you're eight years old, they stick a violin in your hand and you've got to practice. My practice became a form of child abuse. By the time I was 12 or 13 and playing footy, I had to practice two hours a day. And I just did. I don't know whether kids today obey their parents, but I think I sort of did. Two hours a day is 40 minutes between the time you get up in the morning and the time you get up at school. 40 minutes soaring away at a violin. 40 minutes from the time you get school, come back from school and, and have dinner. And then 40 minutes after dinner. When you've got to fit in life and footy training and those sorts of things, that, that was just huge. But I became very good. There's a, there's a famous book written where someone points out that the key to genius is 10,000 hours. If you put in 10,000 hours, you become sort of a genius at things. And uh, I don't think I put in 10,000 hours on the, on the violin, but I put in seven or 8,000. I became very good. So good that at the age of 12, I passed with a mark of 99. I passed a violin exam, which was three grades higher than the binding exam I'd have to sit if I was sitting it for VCE or matriculation. So then I decided I was going to do violin as a subject so I don't have to study for that. I know how to do that and I'm going to get a, a mark of 99. That's big deal because in those days if you got a first class on a, at modern history or something, that was, a, that was 78. And I'm always going to get 99 uh, for the violin. And so I probably did. That was a real sliding doors moment. My parents couldn't afford university. In those days, you had to pay. That changed a few years later under Gough Whitlam, but in those days, you had to pay. So I wasn't going to go to university unless I got a scholarship that paid for everything. Um, those scholarships were rare um, the, to the top 1.5% of students. And it was only my violin mark that pushed me over that limit. Had I not got that high a violin mark, I'd already been accepted into an orchestra in the United States. So as a 17-year-old, never been out of the country except when I came in, I would have you know, gone, been left my family and got shoveled out to north of South Carolina and joined an orchestra. Instead, I did law and had a good life. <laughs> just, just, just on that, you know, it's just such an absurdity. And it's not, I, 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 I enjoyed the violin. I didn't enjoy the, the hard work. But it never occurred to me that it would that this thing that I've sort of, when I got to uni, I never played the violin, almost never played it again. And I'm not a lover of classical music, I love rock and roll. Um, but it's so, so strange that something like that could play such a sliding doors, pivotal moment in your whole life, it did. So you complete your law degrees and join a small suburban law firm. Give us an insight into Australia at that time, so 1960s, late 1960s, and, and also during that time you were appointed a partner a year later in 1969 of the law firm. Talk us through that period of your life. Yeah, I'd like to say, because I was so brilliant, uh, it was probably because it was a very small firm. There were two partners in there and one was going to leave. Um, so <laughs> might have had something to do with that. I graduated at at 21, and this is, I'm only 22, and I've started, I'm 21, and I've started um, work at this law firm, and I'm doing all the court work. I'm doing all the litigation going into the local magistrate's courts. That was brilliant. Uh, it learned, teaches you to think on your feet, it teaches you 
all the parts of the law that you never learned at law school. It was absolutely brilliant. Uh, and I, I had a great partner whose interview of me um, before he gave me the job was to ask me what football team I supported and talk about footy, which was great. He offered me the job the next morning. Turned out to be very lucky because the jobs that I wanted to get that I'd been interviewed for, they didn't ring until the next week, by which time I was gone. <laughs> <laughs> I, n I now don't think I made a mistake. He, he was brilliant. It was out, out at Reservoir. You, say, you don't say Reservoir in Reservoir, it's Reservoir. Um, at one stage I had f five of the top ten on the win wanted list with my clients. And they were decent, honourable people who always paid their bills. <laughs> Talk us through some of the, the legal matters that you're working on. Um, basically anything that, anything that went to court. I became very proficient at divorce, family law, doing the family law myself. Um, when the Family Law Act came in, I had 14 of the first 15 cases. So I converted all of my cases from the old Matrimonial Act, Matrimonial Law Act, to the Family Law Act. Completely different procedure, no fault procedure. And so I ran those. My partner did all the commercial work, all the um, property work. We started dabbling in property. There was a book that I'd read when I was 15 or 16, which sh sort of shows where my mind was at, um, called How to Turn How I Turned a Thousand into a Million in Real Estate in My Spare Time. Everyone's heard of it. It's a 1950s book. And the rules were brilliant. And so we bought a house together and then we bought another one and then we kept doing that. And then in the practice, by that time, I was doing the personal injury work. So that's industrial accidents and car accidents. Most of the people working in factories in the northern suburbs were migrants. Um, they were put on machines. They often couldn't work properly. They had a lot of industrial accidents and, and we'd get compensation. And we were finding that the money that they were awarded, which was sometimes supposed to provide for much of the rest of their life, was always gone in a year. Never failed. They'd invent ways of losing it. They'd lend it to family and relatives. They'd get speculated upon. They'd get people who'd give them wrong advice, people to take money from them. It was, it was inevitable. And you've seen the same stuff with lottery winners. Have a look at it, lottery winners and how many keep the money that they got. None of them. Um, and so these poor people in the northern suburbs were just losing money they n couldn't afford to lose. And so what we started doing is, uh, in 1975, is instead of sending you your cheque, saying, here's a letter, congratulations, there's the cheque, and here's my, my, my bill, um, we'd say, the cheque's ready, come in and talk to us. And when you came in to talk to us, we'd give you an hour of free advice. The advice was, don't blow your money, everyone else does. And the way not to blow your money is buy a house or a flat. And we found that all we'd done is we'd invent another way, we'd invented another way for them to lose their money. Because they'd go to the local estate agent, they'd get ripped off or they'd buy something they didn't know anything about. <clears throat> and so a year later we said, and we'll find it for you. In 75, I had three kids smashed up in an accident. They each got a bit of compo. I said, why don't you invest it? We don't know how, I'll do it for you. So I took them along to some auctions, and at one of the auctions we bought a two-bedroom flat in Reservoir for $4,000 in 1975. So that tells you the value of money, because that flat today would be 600000 and it's still the same $4,000 flat, except it's, it's many years later. And um, the rent it was paying was $8 a week. Um, on a, on a $4,000 investment, that's a 10% return. It was a beauty. So I arranged a, a mortgage for them, um, and, uh, and they asked if I'd look after it. And I said, well, I'm not going to collect the rent. So I got my secretary to. It was just around the corner from the office. She hated that. And so we collected the rent, paid off the mortgage, and basically um, that was their investment. That went well. Uh, they loved it. They told their friends. Uh, the next year we bought three flats like that and put people into it. Um, the year after that we bought a block of 25. When I say a block, it was a, it's a widespread development of single units, 25, and we removed all of those. And we, went, we were charging just legal fees and then to manage the asset. And then this idea of putting people together into investments 
uh, morphed into something that was starting to take you know some r r real real action. We weren't concentrating on it at all. We were having fun with it because we were playing with property ourselves. And uh, but the re returns were spectacular. Between 1975 and 1988, the worst result, the worst result that we produced from any one of these things for our clients is we doubled their money tax-free in three years. There was no result worse than that. There were several where we doubled the money in a year. So if you did nothing else other than follow what we'd said, you, you were building, I mean, really significant wealth. And I thought I knew why that was. That was because I was an unmitigated genius. <coughs> It turns out that it probably had as much to do with the fact that inflation was running at 10% a year. And th that was the secret. If you bought a $10,000 flat, took a $6,500 mortgage, which was easy to get, you put three and a half in, if that property goes up just 10% a year in value, then at the end of three years, it's worth 13 and a half, you pay off your six and a half mortgage and you got six, or well, you started off with three. You double your money. And if, you, and if you're good at selecting the property and good at looking after it and good at selling it, then the returns are better than that. So there's a business in that. So we started doing that on a bigger and bigger basis. The demand was huge. We used to say, might not be completely true, that, that our only marketing uh, tool was a baseball bat saying, look, I'm sorry, I can't take your money this year. Um, <laughs> it was partly true. You know, we had a lot of people wanting to do this because we put your name on title. It was your property. All we did is we found you the property, we looked after it and we took a small fee going in and out. A really small fee. Um, and then we got from buying units to buying other properties, some office buildings, some industrial buildings and then um, and they kept providing the same sort of, you know, just off the wall returns. Then 90, 1998 came um, the uh, massive um, interest rate rises and, you know, the, uh, there's the crash that we have to have, as Paul, Ke Paul, Paul Keating called it, and it was a massive crash, uh, the massive property crash, and we worked our way through that as a firm. We worked our way through that really honourably. Every investment that invest our clients had was underwater, every one. Uh, the market had crashed, properties had fallen 50% or more in, in value. A lot of them had fallen 80% in value, not ours, but a lot of them had, and every one of them was underwater. So what we said to our clients is that, uh, look, we're sorry it's not our fault. We won't charge you anything. So by that time we had a massive staff paying them massive money to look after the properties. We won't charge you. We won't charge you the fees. We won't charge you expenses. Until you've got your money back, there's no fees. So we ran that for a number of years. The crash started to ease off in 1992. And so then we started doing this in a more formal way. We set up MCS property as a separate entity to look after it. It was still part of the legal firm, but it wasn't. It was a separate entity. It wasn't listed, but it was a separate entity on the side, MCS property. And by that time, we'd had one of these blinding insights. We'd realised that there was one part of the property market that was just materially better than any other and it had unlimited potential, and that was food-based shopping centres. You know them, they're, they're everywhere. Um, a Woolworths or a Coles at one end, a, a little supermarket or something else at the other, 30 or 40 specialty tenancies in the middle, 600 car spots out front. They're untouchable, untouchable as an investment, supported by some insanely good contract terms, lease terms, so that Woolworths and Coles would increase the rent they were paying you even if they're not making any more profit because the rent was based on their turnovers. So you got a percentage of... Really? OK, they all changed that. They changed that later. They, they, did, they can't change it. They couldn't change the leases. So what they started doing is building shopping centres themselves, putting their own sort of lease in, then selling it. Most people who bought them didn't realise the massive difference it made to their investment. So we never touched one of those. But there were stacks of these food-based convenience shopping centres that were around. And, and then we realised additional gold. There was just gold everywhere you looked. You know, property gold. You're invulnerable to market movements. 
So if there is a big mothership next door to you, a Westfield shopping centre, a billion dollar asset like that, um, when the market turns down, their tenants creak. Our tenants don't creak. Our customers were coming in three and a half times, average three and a half times a week for their food and shopping. Every time they get their supermarket shopping, they walk past some specialty shops. They buy the papers and everything else that's there. We, we don't have, we wouldn't have, we threw out every specialty tenant that wasn't something that you'd buy every day. Newspapers, um, food, fruit, meat, other, those sorts of specialty tenants. Never a jeweller. They, they were there and we'd let them go and get food based tenancies in that. So they don't creak. These are mums and dads running their own businesses and they're, they're, they're terrific people and, they're, and it's their business so they live in it and as long as you've got engines at both ends of the shopping centre driving customers in and so we concentrate on building the asset, building up the turnover of Coles Woolworths, doing everything we can to help, creating, improving their businesses, thereby improving the businesses of all the guys in between and, and, and then you, you just get these things. <coughs> We approached Aldi. <clears throat> Aldi had come into the country. Brilliant German retailer. Prices ridiculously, significantly lower than supermarkets. And they had, a, they had their, this is what we do, this is how we do it, Germanic way, remember this is it. And we kept coming to them saying, Listen, you should be in a shopping centre. No, we never be. You should be in a shopping centre. We kept this up and finally um, they agreed. We put them into a shopping centre in the middle of uh, New South Wales. And um, and we got all the experts to tell us what, what would happen. There were a whole bunch of weak tenancies down one end of the shopping centre, Woolworths down this end, 30 odd specialty tenants in between, and we were um, going to put this 1,000 metre, Woolworths was like 4,000 metre or 3,000 metre, we we're going to put a 1,000 metre Aldi in, in this end, and uh, we asked all the experts what would happen to the Coles turnover. Um, Coles turnover was 30 million. They said they think that this will do 10 million, so the Coles turnover will drop to 20 million, from 30 to 20. So we worked out what that would cost us in terms of the rent that they were paying, and we thought, okay, it's still, it's a close decision, but these are a good, good retailer. No, nobody knows anything. Aldi wouldn't give us turnover figures, so we didn't, couldn't necessarily work out what we were losing. So what we did is we stuck a, in those days, mobile cameras were, hard, cameras were hard to get. We got one and focused it on a couple of one of the tills at the Aldi, and we could work out their turnover to within a you know, relatively small percentage. <coughs> and what we learned is that Aldi weren't doing the 10 that everyone expected them to. They're doing around 12, and the Coles turnover, instead of dropping from 30 to 18, went up to 32. You cannot believe what we'd just done to the shopping centre. We'd increased the basic food traffic, the thing that all about, you know, our people are turning up the shopping centre three and a half times a week to, to buy, we'd increased it from 30 to 44 million. Increased the turnover 50% of the shopping centre. And then you, the, another lunatic thing happens, of course, no one's seen this. No one's seen uh, Aldi. No one can believe their prices. So the number of people that are going from one end to the other, to the other, to the other, comparing prices was insane. And you think, and you think to yourself, that it's only the very poor, yeah, this is in country New South Wales, so it's only going to be the very poor that are doing that. Well, of course it was the very poor that were doing it, which there were a lot, but it was also the time rich. It was also the older people who've got the time to find out how everything, so the turnover of the specialty tenants more than doubles. So the rent we can charge them goes up very substantially. So this shopping centre starts producing numbers that are off the wall. Just ridiculous numbers. As we're doing these things, you learn. We're lawyers and, and people like that. We're not shopping centre people. But when you've got a problem to solve, you get, gather everyone around and you solve the problems. And uh, we had a shopping centre that we bought in Oakley. It was a bit creaky. And when we got out there and had a really good look after, you know, a really good look, um, you'd find that it's very Greek and there's no fish shop in there. So we scoured the, the, the whole neighbourhood for the very best fish shop and I asked them to come into the shopping centre. They refused. We said, we'd, we'll buy your business and, and bring you into the shopping centre. They refused. They said, well, we'll buy your business and your freehold. And they agreed. They came to the shopping centre. And it was like giving it an electric shock. You know, having a brilliant, the best local fish shop in your shopping centre. Saturdays there, 
you couldn't find a bit of floor on which to put a chair because it was filled with um, the, the local Greek community. You know, so you, shopping centres are wonderful, um, organic. We, we had another shopping centre that we bought in uh, Mwilumba, a gorgeous place, um, the nearest shopping centre to Nimbin, the heart of the druggy and hip community. Um, whereas when we were driving around, um, uh, when, we, we, when we look at, to acquire a shopping centre, we look around the area and we, we drove down the streets of Nimbin and you could see all these people saying, suits, you know, suits, suits in the street. Um, gorgeous. The, the shopping centre was upstairs because the area is very flood prone. Um, so car parking downstairs, but to get the shopping centre, you went a, a ramp upstairs. And we found that uh, people would go up the stairs, go that way, that way, that way into the Coles Woolworths, and when they came out, they'd go back the way they'd come. You could understand that. How do you fix that? So half the shopping centre's dead. And, and if you can give these guys a reason to live, it massively boosts income. And so we kept going up there and talking and thinking about it. And we went into the town. Uh, we bought the chemist shop on the basis that we would buy it and move him into the shopping centre. So we put him into the dead end. And that helped it a little bit, but nowhere near enough. And we keep going up there and sitting and having coffee and trying to work out what we would do. And what we did is insanely trivial. You know that whenever there's, you're in shopping centres, they've got drapes and things with signs and, and, and so on all the way through, coloured drapes. So we decided we'd have those, but they would be, have a bright colour on one side and a dark colour on the other side. So as you came out of the coals and you looked the way we didn't want you to go, it, was a dark br it looked dark brown and dowdy. If you looked the way we wanted you to go, it was a light colour and light. And the next day, people are starting to go around the shopping centre like that. The, the, the rent we get on the specialty tenants goes up massively because they're making massively more money. You, you, find, you just you make up these things and they were extraordinary. So we became very, very good at shopping centres. We, we had our own leasing team, we had our own development team. We had some of the best leasing individuals in the country working in our office. Uh, well, never in our office, they're flying around. But uh, So we built up a, a team of over 100 people that did everything in shopping centres and they were just very good. Take me inside the key metrics you analysed prior to investing in assets. So it started off as residential investment and development, moved into commercial and retail. What did you look at prior to? Everything comes down to the return and the safety of the return. What we found out is that shopping centres are an extraordinarily safe um, return. Westfield used to come out and tell everyone how safe their model was. It wasn't. Well, Westfield are brilliant. Their shopping centres are brilliant. But um, they can lose very big tenants. We can't lose them. Coles has got a 40-year lease. Um, it can't get that sort of turnover anywhere else. The last thing the Coles or Woolworths would do is leave their place and ha have the opposite one come in and lease them. I mean, of course. So you've got an engine that's always going to be there. And any engine, everyone knows, everyone in retail knows that if you've got someone doing 30 or 40 million turnover there, you can hang this number of specialty tenants off there. If you can put another food business at the other end, then you can ha ha hang more out there. And if you're giving them the car parking, maybe it's changed today. I don't know. I'd, I'd be very surprised if it has. No one will go shopping in a Chadston for their daily food. Why would you go through that whole mess of thing, look for, for, through 35 million car spots and try and park somewhere and reel a, a trolley through this massive car park and over boulders and over bumps and everything else like that? You wouldn't. You go to our shopping centres, you park outside, go in, come straight out. Um, and so that was something else that we learned. The best place where we could buy a shopping centre was as close as we could get it to one of these big motherships. The best shopping centre, the best shopping centre that we had, the best performing shopping centre that we had was in Penrith, where we b bought one that was hard up against the, the massive shopping centre that they'd built there, massive shopping centre. And our food shopping centre was insane. In those days, if you're doing 30, 40 million turnover, um, in a supermarket that was massive. So we extended the shopping centre, put one was Woolworths, whichever one, we, we did the opposite one at the other end. It started doing 50, 60, 70 million. So it's just this, these huge 
engines of driving the growth. And then we expanded the shopping centre, kept, kept expanding the shopping centre. In, uh, in Geraldton, we were handling the shopping centre so well, there was a shopping centre at one end of town and a shopping centre at the other one, we started to blow away the other one. So then we bought it. And Woolworths has a whole bunch of specialty tenants it likes to be around. Coles has a different like. So we made this one, you know, the Coles Base Centre, and this one the Woolworths Base Centre, and let them go head to head, which takes the retail away from the town, makes these things incredibly strong. It's such a fantastic area in which to play because you basically can't get it wrong. We did. Well, having said that, we did. We bought this beautiful shopping centre and it was doing really poor numbers and we thought, oh, well, we're geniuses. Um, we'll have no trouble um, getting it to, to massively grow. Anyone could improve these numbers and we couldn't. It took us many years to learn that the reason why is it was right on the coast, beautiful shopping centre, beach right along there. Of course, then you're only drawing from a semicircle. There are no customers on that side of your shopping centre. Shopping centres need to be there and be surrounded by customers there. We'd cut off half the customers in the water. The fish aren't going to come and buy at our place and never repeated that mistake. Uh, we couldn't resurrect the shopping centre. We, we improved it. But that was a, that was a f fatal flaw that you learn as, as you're going through these things. I want to ask you, just from a, a deal structuring perspective, how did MCS property work as a, as a listed vehicle? So it wasn't really a listed. We were the manager of everything. Um, so it was owned by us. And if you'd invested in, in one of these shopping centres, then we were managing it for you. We always put all of the fees that you would have paid, we didn't take, we, we left them in, in the vehicle, we invested with you. Often we invested our own money in there as well. We made another rule that we weren't allowed to buy anything that we weren't offering our investors, so that they knew that we were with them, that we were backing, that, this, that our money was in the same things that, they, that we were putting them into. This was stupendous. When we had three kids on title, you, we could ask the titles office to each offer you each a certificate of title for your one third undivided interest in the flat. And then when we had six people and seven and eight and 10, the title's office, once, once we got to 20, the title's office said, you're going to get stuff. We're not going to give you separate titles. So we uh, went to the lawyers and decided we're going to issue a writ of certiorari to com compel a public servant to do what he's obliged to do. And uh, the, the, the lawyer said, oh, you don't have to do that. You can create just a bare trust. Not a, you're not creating a trust, just a bare trust. So I hold on behalf of you 25. And that I could be a, a $2 company. So we set up a lot of those. All of our syndicates ended up being a bare trust holding for all of you as individuals. But there's a problem. Technically is a legal partnership. The law prevents oversized, outsized partnerships. It prevents partnerships being for more than 20 people. So then you have to be a company. If you're taxed as a company, you can't negatively gear. You can't get the losses going to the individuals. So when we gave you returns of 14, 15% a year, which we were, if you were an investor in every single MCS syndicate from 1992 onwards, your average annual return was 18.9% and you never paid tax because we had tax losses that we could offset, the depreciation of the property, uh, the interest on the mortgages and all, all of that, interest on the well, mortgages were then fairly substantial, 60 odd percent, which was safe in those days because you had inflation in increasing the value of the property. <clears throat> and so you're getting these ridiculous returns tax-free. But if we had to set it up as a company, the company tra traps your losses. Can't, you can't utilise the losses. <clears throat> so we, um, I approached Alan Myers, who was a, a young QC, who was brilliant, since become even more brilliant. I mean, he's an absolutely brilliant QC. And I said, how do we do this? How do we get around the fact that, you know, we, we don't want to use a... A, 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 any sort of a structure which is a taxable structure. We want it to be taxed at the individual level and the law says you can't. And so I, I gave him that brief around November, the uh, day before Christmas or on Christmas Day, he rings me and he says, Julius, um, I'm going to drop this opinion in your letterbox today. Guard it with your life. It's the best opinion I've ever written. <clears throat> and this opinion wasn't very long and he went right through 
the whole of English history and said that back in 1066, you know when you buy a home with your wife, you either buy it as joint tenants or as tenants in common. The difference is joint tenants is if one of you dies, the other one gets it. As joint tenants, if one of you dies, the other one doesn't get it. It goes to whoever you provided for under your will. So you retain your separate interests in that. He said that's never been taken out of the law. So if you set this up as a joint tenancy, you can, it, the people can each have their own separate interests and then thereby, by implication, be taxed on it. Seriously? So what if I have a thousand? Yes, he says. So we set these things up as joint acquisitions. Now, obviously, we still use the bare trustee because someone's got to hold all of the, you know, the titles of all these 1,000 people for them. So there's a, a trust company in there. And all the time, our structure got copied by everyone. When we, when we sold out, we had a billion and a half of syndicates under management. The second biggest was Centro with 700 million. Um, so there were scores of syndicates starting up, all copied our structure, all copied our documents. Every single one of them missed. They saw that there's a trustee there. Every single one of them missed that we were a joint acquisition, being taxed as partners, not as, as separate. That was Alan Myers' uh, genius. So that meant we could deliver tax losses to each of you. So assuming that we'd, our mortgage, you know, the mortgage was 60% of the value of the property and interest on that, depreciation of the property, management fees and everything else, there's never a taxable income. Even better, there's often a taxable loss. If there's a taxable loss, then I say to you at the end of the year, G'day Rob, uh, um, your returns this year is we're giving you 16% on your money, here's the cheque and here's a piece of paper, this is what you report to the tax department. You got 16% on your money but you're claiming a loss of so and so and you can take that loss off your other income. So we were good at what we were doing. By 2002, MCS, as you mentioned earlier, had over $1.4, $1.5 billion of, of assets under management and also managed over 2,000 tenants. Reflecting on, on this period, how did you go about maintaining relationships with tenants while still ensuring that the, the properties were going up in value when, and you were still returning? Yeah, that, was, that was fairly easy. I, I might say to you, this crummy little north suburban legal firm, which had a billion and a half of shopping centres under management. We are the largest landlord to Coles and second largest to Woolworths or vice versa in the whole country. We had more shopping centres than anyone else in the country. That didn't make us the biggest by a, a long way. Westfield might have had 30 or 40, but each of theirs were, were worth a billion. We had 55 and each is, our, our average value was probably around $30,000, $30 million. So Westfield were uh, much, much bigger and much more specialised than we were. But we were at the end, which, which I reckon generated the most growth. When we bought the asset, we, we had a, a simple, had a incredibly simple, not software because it didn't exist in those days, but four or five things that I wanted to know about a property. I could project its income. And I could work out what the returns were going to be. Because your anchors, the, the, the Coles and the Woolworths, were always paying the rent plus CPI. You just put in a CPI number, you know 70 or 80% of your income in advance. You know the special ten tenants, how many you can hang off each one. If that's right, then you know basically what their income's going to be. Um, they'll pay you less rent in a poor area, more rent in a, maybe more rent in a, um, a rich area. Uh, so you, projecting your income becomes really, really easy. If then you don't get greedy, if you don't want to, you need to keep everyone, you need to keep everyone in that circle really happy. Tenants will pay rent increases and they'll pay substantial rent increases if you can provide them substantially extra traffic. And so us and our investors have to be at the end of the line picking up what's left. We've just got to run the business well enough that it's producing increasing income. Isn't hard. And, and the more you do it, and the better you get at it. And um, we used to say, why would you go to an estate agency who hires someone off the street to manage a shopping centre? Why wouldn't you bring that in-house? And so all the other syndicators didn't, we did. This sort of property investment within those sorts of parameters it was actually incredibly easy. Lots of work. So we had staff that were uh, flying all around the country all the time, looking at, uh, working on the shopping centres. And then we had that glorious thing where uh, 
these cheap airlines came in, so instead of paying $1,400 to travel to Port, Perth, it was 400 Whoopee! That went straight to the bottom line. <laughs> so then in, in 2003, it was announced that the acquisitive Centro Properties Group was to acquire MCS property in a $193.5 million deal, closing the, 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 the final chapter on a remarkable journey for the business in across sort of 10 years as MCS property, but for 28 years. Yeah. In, uh, as a law firm, you said at the time, money isn't what makes the decision, it's a sort of fit and the opportunity that's presented. Take us inside this deal, if you could, as I understand it, it was months in the making, you'd been approached before, but... Could have been years in the making. So Centro had approached us. We were an extraordinary fit for them. Part of what we did to be better at what we were doing is we needed great property people. The only real property course for people who wanted to study in property was at the RMIT. So we went to the RMIT and we said, we'd like to work with you. Uh, we're happy to give you money. Uh, we're happy to provide scholarships. In return, can we get a pick of your graduates? They said, yeah. So for eight or 10 years, the top two, we, we took the top one or two students out of the top property college in Australia and it came onto our staff. Um, so for, for Centro, they were, substantially in shopping centres. We were wholly in shopping centres. Uh, they desperately needed good staff. We had terrific staff. They approached us and we agreed a deal, then they changed the deal. We walked away angrily. A long time later, they approached us again and, uh, and then something else happened that we didn't like, so we walked away angrily. And then we got to a stage where our value was so bound up in the fact that every year we were delivering 20% growth to the bottom line. So I could show you my numbers going back X number of years and we were delivering 20% growth to the bottom line. Extraordinary growth in those days. And it's untouchable, you know, just except for the fact, what if you can't get stock? And so what we fed on, what we adored was these small food-based convenience shopping centres. And there weren't that many available. So we had to go higher up the food chain. So we bought things like Brandon Park and things that are you know, more expensive and bigger and harder. So they're still not the Westfield type. And so we learned to, be, learned to be good at them. They weren't coming up. And what had happened is that all these smart guys in all the big offices in town, they found that the little places where we, they, they're not interested. They didn't want to buy anything under 20 million, so we moved up to 20 million. Then they didn't want to buy anything under 30 or 40, so we moved up to the 30 or 40s. And then they started seeing the results that we were producing and they started moving down. So everything became more difficult. We really couldn't see that we could keep sustaining 20% growth for ad infinitum. That becomes a big deal because your multiple that you valued at if you're producing 20% growth and have for 10 years, your multiple's like 15. And if you're gonna be producing five or 6% growth, then your multiple's down to five. So you could actually end up working for another 10 years and get no extra value. So um, I rang up Andrew Scott and I said, you got some time for a chat? And he said, yes. So I, I drove around to his place and said, uh, I'm prepared to talk. This is the number. I'm not gonna sell for less, but at that number, uh, I will sell and, and it will give you, and I, it, I just had literally what I'd done is um, I wrote it on the back of an envelope, the points I was going to make. I literally walked in with an envelope and had these note points on the, on the back of it. And um, he's as smart as a whippet. He's, yeah, he's, he's brilliant. And he had a, a genius uh, chief financial officer and I'm halfway through the spiel, and he says, just a minute, calls the chief financial officer in, he says, okay, do that again. Um, so I did it again, and he said, before I left, he'd gone out with uh, um, the C CFO, and uh, came back and said, yeah, okay, we're interested. And I said, don't screw me on the price. I mean, you've done that before. Don't screw me on the price. And he said, oh, I, I, can't I can't confirm that I won't, but we're interested. And so the, the deal was then done. It was done at that price. Centro hit the wall about five years later. What did Centro get out of us? We were a colossal acquisition for them. 
Um, it gave them staff at a time that they, that they might have found that difficult. It gave them assets, it gave them better assets, it gave them higher yields. He looked after the shopping centres differently to the way that I would, but that was, he had his own ways. And they were going on a massive expansion path. They then went into America, where they bought billions of dollars worth of property, uh, with billions of dollars worth of debt. Economic times came around uh, and they had probably 70 or 80 banks in syndicates handling these billion do billions of dollars of debt and uh, they needed to roll over the debt around Christmas one year and out of all of the banks, the French bank and the CBA said, no, we want to think about rolling it over and Centra had no time. The, the, fund, the funding was due to be rolled over when they couldn't necessarily roll it over, they had to announce that to the market. That was it. So someone in the bank um, came up with the bright idea that you could force Centro to have to go to the market and say, we haven't got approval from all of our banks to roll over the debt. And they said, they said to Centro, and I know that to be true, that's okay, the market won't worry. Ah, the market basically shut Centro down. Like within days, well, you can't, get, you can't roll over billions of dollars worth of funding. And some genius in at the bank thought, yeah, no, no, no one's going to worry about that. It blew them up. They were a $10 billion entity. They were good. OK, um, people may not have liked everyone at Centro. Centro was seen to be arrogant. There were people in at Centro who were. Most of the people that I know there who were arrogant were justifiably arrogant because they were very good. They had a guy in there who could walk into a shopping centre and his specialty was sight lines. I didn't even know what sight lines were. And, and he could walk into a shopping centre and say, you can't have that, you can't have that. So you, people have got to be able to see here and there and it made the shopping centre sing. So they blew up this, this amazing business. I want to ask you about Chapara Healthcare. You're a foundation investor and majority oh, shareholder. Sorry, sorry, sorry. We've all been bought out, and I'm on a restraint of trade. Five years, I'm not even allowed inside a shopping centre. It's not, not completely right, but it was like that. I really can have nothing to do with syndication of shopping centres or shopping centres. And I retired, and I woke up on the day after they'd paid the money, because that was six weeks they had to get ASX approval, and I wake up and it's a beautiful morning, the windows are open, the birds are singing, the, the smell of whatever the air is outside is coming into the room and I'm sitting back with my arms behind my head and I'm smiling and I can't believe it. this is the first day since I was about seven that I haven't had been completely full of what that day's next day is going to be. I've got no appointments, I've got no one I've got to ring, nothing to do and I couldn't believe how wonderful it was, just nothing to do. The next morning I woke up and it's exactly the same. And the third morning I wake up and I go, oh, fucking nothing to do. And, and that was it. And so I start looking around for something else. <clears throat> and through someone, they said, why not do exactly what you've been doing? Why not do property syndicates, but on aged care assets? So you split the asset, the aged care asset, into a property investment, which then the operating entity, the aged care operator, leases. Complete market terms. Lots of potential problems in that area which we avoided. Massive problems because e everywhere in the world that that had been tried, it had blown up uh, because one or other gets out of kilter. Either the rent's going up too high so the operator goes bust or the rent not, not, isn't going up strong enough. Um, and the answer, the truth is it's got to be somewhere in between. The return, you can't grow the assets qu quick enough because the income of an aged care operator is limited by what the government pays and they're tight. Um, so there is a way of doing it. We did it. it. Worked well. The assets were terrific, but you needed operators. And what we thought was a absolute stone-cold motherless home run, which it was, and it was such a big home run that we uh, put it all together and we, are, we are, and our investors who had the property, so we had over 400 million of property in there, and then we listed the whole thing at over 600 million, and then we were out. We may have d helped destroy the industry because in all the documents it, it was clear that we were making about 50 million profit. 
a lot of people in government and other places were devastated that a private operator could make 50 million out of aged care. No one saw that we had 650 million of assets tied up, 450 odd million of property assets tied up, and a business that was doing all of this. No one cared about that, and 50 million return on 650 is modest, on any basis is modest, and they went, went nuts. And so it's never been revealed. All of these inquiries have never revealed what was the single biggest reason for the, uh, the tearing apart of the aged care industry, which the government's held back all the money. They cut back everywhere, every, every way that you could get growth, you, they, they were holding back. And, and it created enormous problems. So if you're making money out of aged care and then all of a sudden the 50 million becomes 40, becomes 30, becomes 20, you're causing aches and pains everywhere, but you, it, and they go on because every single person in the business then needs to cut somewhere. And as soon as you want to cut, then the government says, whoa, hold on, things aren't going well enough. Now we need to supervise you more. So now you've got to hire a whole bunch of people to handle the supervision. Nurses in aged care don't do nursing anymore. You are not allowed in an aged care business to see a patient who needs care without at the minute, after the minute, straight away, going back to your office and writing up what you'd seen and what you'd done and notes about it. Because if you don't have the notes, you can get sued by the government, you can lose your, your licence. So they've created this bureaucratic nightmare. So being a private operator in that space is nearly impossible. And what was happening, of course, is that some people were private operators, the other people were not-for-profits, really good people like churches and other people doing the right thing, but lousy at business. When you looked at the numbers of how we operate and how much we were making a bed, at a time when we were making I can't, don't hold me to these numbers, I can't remember them. But at the time we were making about $20,000 a bed, uh, most of the not-for-profits were making 2000 a bed. And so if the government tweaked the numbers down, this, this, they're at a loss. We're not. We're starting to get squeezed, but they're at a loss. So it, the government basically destroyed the industry. I don't know if that's what everyone else is saying to you, but I'm telling you that that's what happened. And then they had held an inquiry, and they came out with a whole bunch of other things that you got... I's you got to dot, T's you got to cross, other things you got to employ. Yeah. And then, then people became smart. People saw, th th these are just consequences which are just absurd when, when you have that sort of a situation. But people realise that 70% of your overhead is, is wages. And, and a large part of that is nurses' wages. And yet out of all of the nurses, only a Div 1 nurse is allowed to prescribe and inject. So operators being squeezed for every cent then realised that I don't actually need any other nurse. I just need one or two Div 1 nurses around all the time. And all of these others can become heavy lifters. You know, the people who've got to do the hard work, move the bedpans, move the people on and off beds, take them into other rooms. We need, don't need nursing qualifications. And then, of course, you find that the only people who are prepared to work that hard are migrants and refugees just coming into the country. And so aged care became full of massively less number of nurses and massively more of these people. And that's the necessary result of cutting the, the, uh, the money down. So the government then holds this massive inquiry. What, what's it fine? They're not putting enough money in. Well, what have they been doing for eight years except ripping all the money out? I want to change tack and, uh, and talk about your poker career. You've been uh, a noted poker player for some time. You've donated over 1.1 million dollars US to various charities. Yeah. What? So I'm a poker nut. I have been since I was six or seven. That's, this is probably not what your time is like today. But back in that time, everyone played poker. I need to tell you. So 12 years after that, I'm doing first year law and I'm reading the Summary Offences Act and I find that poker is an illegal game. No such thing as an illegal game. Games become illegal because you're doing something or other. No, poker is an illegal game. It's like two-up, it's an illegal game. How do we get this sort of, sort of crap in the law? Uh, that was taken out some time after. Uh, so we're six, we're playing poker at school for matches um, and then for halfpennies and pennies and farthings and you know, for, for small amounts of currency and then bigger and bigger. And I've had a, a regular poker game. One of the guys who's a regular at that poker game when we were eight became a federal court judge. Uh, another one, as I said, is a, uh, there are two of them. One's heart surgeon at Cabrini, one's heart surgeon at uh, 
Epworth. And, uh, and so we just playing, just loved it. It's an amazing game. And then when the new form of poker came out, which came out only about 15 years ago, I, I could be wrong on that, uh, you know, Texas Hold'em, uh, I became besotted with it. And so I started playing for money, which I'd never played, played in casinos, which I'd never done before. And, and I've been successful. Um, I don't play a lot, probably average five or six tournaments a year. To be up at 1.1 million US dollars um, is, is a result I'm, I'm incredibly proud of. I'm good at it, but it's, it's an extraordinary game. Um, there's a professor at Harvard University, he's been there for about 25, 30 years, Professor Neeson, who says, who wants to have poker as a compulsory subject for second year law students. And that's because he's right. Poker is a metaphor for life. There's almost nothing in life that doesn't come down to have, making a probability assessment and then deciding whether that's what you want to do. I often gave this in talks that I'd give about property investing. Um, I'd say to the audience, um, I'm going to make you an offer. Uh, how good is this offer? We'll toss a coin. You can produce the coin. You can toss it. You can call. If you get it wrong, you, you pay me a dollar. If you get it right, I'll pay you two dollars. Are you going to take that bet? You know, everyone hesitates. Now, are you seriously going to take the bet? Is there anyone in the room who won't take the bet? No hand goes up. I say, OK, let me just change it a bit. Everything the same. It's your coin, you toss, you call. If you lose, you pay me $100. If you win, I pay you $200. Is there anyone in the room not going to take that bet? No. Are there any people more likely to take the bet? Hands go up. I say, OK, I want to change it just one little, one little thing. Everything else is the same, but we're tossing for your net worth. And if you lose, I take all of your net worth. If you win, you get twice. Who wants to toss? Really important. So odds are in everything. Odds are vital. Being on the right side of the odds is, is incredibly important. But then you've got to fit within a framework. You've got to have a look at, at the importance of what it is that you're doing. And you seriously, so for you, having double the net worth makes a little bit of difference. Having none of it, it, it destroys your life. So you're going to take a chance on destroying your life to get a little bit extra? No. Poker teaches you um, the importance of odds. So many things are decided purely by the odds. Football, if you handle it this way, the odds are that they won't carve through you at the back. If you keep all of your players within 80 metres where the ball is, then two things happen. You'll have a lot more players on or around the ball, but if they get it through, you're completely dead. Uh, and so you're balancing up these things uh, the whole time. My final question is, what's next for Julius Coleman? My wife and I have put a huge part of our asset base into philanthropy because I'm a migrant refugee and because I lucked into a terrific education at a, at a local state school. So I went to Elwood Primary, Elwood State, Elwood High School, and they're actually building Elwood High School as I was going through. So they're building the year ahead as I was going through. You can get a good education in some state schools. People in really disadvantaged areas don't. Education in disadvantaged areas in Australia is appalling. And that's because up until recently, we've always thought that education starts at the age of five. What we've found is that if you come from a desperately poor family in a desperately disadvantaged area, you're pretty much almost certainly buggered with no chance of finding a way through. A school became ours, so I did a deal with the government around a school. We then support the school, and we have a big say in how it operates. We took a grade eight from surrounding schools and put them into the new grade nine that we we're forming. So there were 21 children coming from other schools in the area that had been closing down or winding down, and they came into this new school that we'd established with the government. More than 50% of the children coming into grade nine were at grade four or lower. So they'd been at school for a number of years and had fallen a further six months behind for every year that they were at school. So they're coming into grade nine and they're being told today is algebra, 2A and 3C equals Y. And half of them 
can't add seven and nine. What hope you've got? All, all of life becomes is, is bewildering. It, it's just completely beyond you. Uh, in disadvantaged communities, children in these families hear 1,500 words a day. In your family, they'd be hearing six and a half to seven and a half thousand words a day. If you hear 5,000 less words a day for the first five years of your life, you, you, you're not within shooting distance of, you, of your peers. And it's not your fault. You're in a family that's violent, you're in a family that's not working very well, or you're in a disadvantaged area, and no one talks. And so the help you need is, is massive. You know how to read to a child. Everyone does. You put the child on your lap, cuddle him or her, have that warmth and read so that they're reading the words. No. Yeah, that might be the way to do it in a middle class family. The way you do it in a disadvantaged family, this kid has never learned to communicate. Parents don't talk to him except when they're yelling at him. So you sit in front of them and you, and you go, hey, Johnny. Hi, I'm Julius. And you watch to see what happens. He may not know that he has to reach out and hold your hand. Mm. Come and shake my hand. Good on you, Johnny. So what we're going to do is we're going to read this book. It's a book. There on the cover of the book, does that look like a boy or a girl to you? I'm making sure you look me in the eye. Then he looks down at that. I look at you. So Johnny, is that a boy or a girl? He looks down the book, looks you back in the eye. We've got conversation going. He says, it's a boy. That's it. You got it. That's a boy. You look pleased. And over here, is that a boy or a girl? It's a girl. It is a girl. Good on you, Johnny. Well, why don't we give him the name Jack? Why don't we give her the name Jill? And then this book will be about Jack and Jill. So you're running the communication. They don't communicate with anybody. You're running words. I don't, I don't want contact and engaging, which they, which they never do. Uh, that's what people in many of the desperately underprivileged uh, uh, communities in Victoria are like. And, and what it takes to turn that around is massive. So we've put our, um, a huge part of what our, what our total wealth is um, in, into this. Want to make a big difference. It takes up a, a huge amount of time. I've got a, an organisation with some tremendous people there. The first school that we work, we've worked out, the government's now given us 10, asked us to, to do 10. Uh, we, the cost of that's horrific. The, in the, the first school, which is Dupton College, um, when we got there, it was the third lowest SES, socio-economic um, place, non-country in the whole of either the state or the country. Really troublesome. Lots of family violence, lots of everything else like that. And what we learned is that with what we do, we, we, made, we didn't know. We have good people around us, but we're making it up as we're going along. What we learned, the result of what we've learned is that if you ca you're coming through the school, instead of being in grade three and being five years behind, as typically happens, every single child that's done two years early learning with us, every single child is at or, or above national standards for reading and numeracy by the time they're in, in, in grade three in that plan. They're, they're ridiculous numbers. So we've got a formula that we can roll out. Um, we've got a, a wonderful relationship with the government where they want to see this rolled out. They want to improve the lot of, of underprivileged children. So that's been, that's been a phenomenal thing. And in, in exactly the same vein, with the same sort of intention for good, um, I'm building a poker app. <laughs> so the, the, po the poker app is um, when you get cards, you're going to be judged on how you play those cards because everyone else in the room that you're being judged against has got the same cards. We assess you on how you play those cards. I look forward to, uh, to giving the go. Julius Coleman, thanks so much for your time. Good on you. Thanks a lot, Rob.